Welcome. I'm going to introduce myself. Um, I'm Ella Hendricks, Senior Conservator at the Verhoch Museum. And I'll be talking in English. I hope that's not a problem. But if there are questions in Dutch, that's absolutely no problem. Uh, we'll just see how it goes. Um, so the topic of my talk is colour and colour change. And it's one of the six educational themes in the exhibition that's currently running at the Verhoch, um, Verhoch at Work which aims to, to encourage the visitor to look at Van Gogh's work from a slightly different angle, as if looking over his shoulder when at work. And um, I assume many of you have seen the exhibition, but if you haven't yet, I would encourage you, uh, if you have a chance, to, to go and enjoy it afterwards. Van Gogh was well aware that colours change over time. As he put it rather po poetically, having visited the Montpellier Museum, Paintings fade like flowers, thus even St. Delacroix had suffered. Eugène Delacroix was a very important influence for Van Gogh, his, his emotive use of colour and powerful colour contrasts. And this is just one example of a picture uh, that Van Gogh greatly admired. He described it as a beautiful painting because of the contrast of the lemon yellow halo of Christ with the dramatic dark, dark blue and violet and blood red shades of the figures against the emerald green sea. Verhoff was also well informed about uh, colour science and principles of colour mixing and colour application. He'd read, for example, Charles Blank's handbooks on colour theory. And in Charles Blank, there's a good explanation of uh, what's called simultaneous colour contrast, which Verhoff applied in his own paintings uh, to a large extent, though never rigidly um, according to theory. So we have the three primary colours, that's yellow, red and blue. And if we mix two of them, for example, the yellow and the blue, we'll get green. And if you juxtapose green, or apply it besides its opposite complementary colour of red, which is the third primary, then these two colours will act to strengthen each other. So the red and the green will look brighter. The same applies if you apply orange next to blue or violet besides yellow. And this was a very important uh, principle which we find back in Van Gogh's paintings. This is one of the nicest objects that's come down through the Van Gogh family is this lacquer work box of balls of wool with different coloured strands of wool combined uh, with each other. Um, Later, Emile Benner having, recalls having seen this box in the studio of Van Gogh in Paris in 1887, and it's believed that he experimented with these balls of wool to try out different colour combinations, since we find very close parallels in his paintings. You'll note also it forms a nice softness for this stuffed kingfisher, um, which presumably originally had a pedestal and feet, but these must already have been missing because when Van Gogh painted the, the bird in the summer of 87, you can see that he had to invent the feet so it perches rather awkwardly uh, on the side of the river. However, keeping to the topic of colour and colour combinations, what I want to point out here is that the picture was exhibited later without a frame, and so far Hoch has added a, a red painted border, introducing the com complementary colour contrast of red and green. And I show it next to this ball of wool because you can see the close parallel uh, in the the combination of colours, the red, green and the yellow. Unfortunately, though, often the intended complementary colour contrasts have been lost or at least depleted uh, through the effects of colour change. And this is just one example. It's a painting of the Asylum of Saint-Rémy, um, made it in the autumn of 89. And originally there were brighter colour contrasts of the complementary colours, violet and yellow, and as you can see from this detail in the path, the violets have been weakened by the fading of a red lake pigment. So you can see this little part of the painting that was folded over the right edge of the stretcher and be kept in relative dark to give some idea of the original intensity of the colour, which would have contrasted with the yellow reflections in the puddles. Especially problematic in Fahok's later French paintings is his use of uh, the light-sensitive pigments 
including chrome yellow. There were different shades, and some of the shades are sensitive to darkling under influence of light. And also red lake pigments, in particular the, the so-called geranium lake, which was a synthetic eosine lake, um, which he ordered in particular between 88 and 1890. Fakoch was aware of the, the danger that chrome yellows would darken under influence of light. He read about this in Sylvester's uh, memoirs of Delacroix. As you see here, the chrome yellow changing more than gold and turning green with time. And at the bottom you see some modern reconstructions of the, the light-sensitive type of chrome yellow paint used by Van Gogh. So here we have a sample of the paint which has been brushed out, and this is the same sample after light aging. And you can see that the, the greatest degree of darkening occurs here when it's been uh, aged with ultraviolet and visible light. Rather than darkening, the red lake pigments tend to fade. And again, here are some modern reconstructions which try to imitate as closely as possible the different types of red lake paint used by Van Gogh. So they've been brushed out or rolled out to an even film and then darkened, uh, sorry, exposed to light in stages. So here, for example, you see the original colour and you can see a stepwise light ageing as the colour slowly disappears. This sample on the left is the particularly fugitive type of geranium lake that I mentioned. And it turned out that this colour disappeared within a time span of 10 years, equivalent to 10 years in modern museum conditions. So that gives some indication of just how fugitive uh, the colour was. Again, Van Gogh was well aware um, of the fugitive nature of this colour. He mentions in the letter he ranks it amongst the unstable pigments that the Impressionists brought into fashion. But he thought that by applying it extra boldly, uh, all too raw, as he puts it, that would compensate for the effects of change over time. And unfortunately, this has not always turned out to be the case. So why is it important to know about colour change in Fachoch's works? Well, for example, this is a very good uh, copy being made of a picture in the Chicago Institute of Art by an artist. But I wonder if she realises, when trying to understand the materials and techniques, that originally the background walls were violet rather than the light blue colour they are now. Colour change also has a strong impact on the apparent style of a painting. This is just one example. On the right, you see a self-portrait, as it looks now, and on the left, a reproduction of around 1908 in black and white. You can see that the background was originally much more solidly filled in with a wash of colour, which was purple, uh, largely lost now due, again, to the fading of the cochineal lake pigment. And as a result, the blue brush strokes, they seem to, fl sorry, they seem to float They float in the background on the light surface and give much more jaunty, looser, impressionist uh, uh, style than was originally intended. It's also important to take into account colour change when considering the mood of Van Gogh's paintings. This is an example of a, a painting he made. He copied after a painting by Millet. And it's often said, as you can see, the, the colour scheme is very monochrome and there's a lot of cool blues and greens. And it's often said that this reflects the intense feeling of loneliness that Verhoek felt when out alone in the fields. And even to quote at the bottom, as you see, a possessed, it's been described as a possessed metaphor, a poignant portrait of pointless, pointlessness, of cold in a transitive sense. However, in fact, originally the colour scheme would have been warmer and there would have been a lot more variation. So we can see from this detail at the bottom right edge, uh, where the paint has been kept in relative dark underneath the frame. And you can see there's a red lake that has faded further into the painting. So there would have been more warm reds and purples uh, than there are now. Within the museum, growing awareness of these colour changes that have taken place, they're very commonplace in Fachoch's drawings and paintings. Um, it led us to want to be able to visualise the impact of these colour changes, for example, um, through rejuvenated digital images. And after all, you can talk about it with words, but that's not the same as actually seeing it for yourself. And only by piecing together all these bits of detailed information can you gain an overall idea of how the pictures could have looked. So a first broad interdisciplinary effort to do this was prompted by the examination and restoration of the bedroom painting that took place in the period 2008 to 10. Working closely together with Professor Roy Burns on the left, who's a color scientist and director of the Munsell Color Institute, in Rochester, New York. Now, as 
most of you probably know, there are in fact three bedroom paintings. Uh, the top left one is the picture here, which is generally agreed was the first study of this topic. But since it was water damaged in the studio roughly a year later, Fakhoch made two copies, one which is the same size, now at the Art Institute in Chicago, top right, and a smaller copy that was made for his, his sister Will or his mother, which is now in the Musée d'Orsay. And I'll be referring to these other two versions uh, in relation to our picture. Here is our painting, uh, shown on the left before the recent treatment, the recent conservation treatment, and on the right after treatment. And colour in this picture was very important to Van Gogh. As he put it, colour has to do the job. And this simplified colour scheme, simplified balanced colour scheme, was to be suggestive of sleep or rest in general. We're very lucky that we have two letters describing the colours that, that Van Gogh used and the effects he intended. This one, which was written when actually making the painting. And I'm going to focus in particular on his descriptions of the, the walls and the door and the floor, since these have changed, uh, most obviously changed colour. So he describes the walls as pale violet and the doors as lilac, and the floor as having red tiles. And in this letter, written after the picture was finished the next day, again he describes the walls as pale lilac and the floor as a broken and faded red. If we compare the, the colours that he names with how the picture looks now, it's obvious that some colours have changed. Most obviously, uh, the background walls and doors that he describes as lilac and violet are now light blue. And we have evidence for the colour change that's taken place. At the top, you see a microscopic fragment of paint that has been uh, embedded in a perspex block and prepared in cross-section, so you see the build-up of the paint layers. And the top light blue layer, this corresponds to the background wall. But at the bottom of the layer, you can still see these red pigment particles, which is a red lake pigment that has faded towards the surface uh, exposed to light. And this turns out to be a cochineal lake that has disappeared from the paint mixture. There's also evidence for colour change in the floor. When the painting was last treated in 1931, the bottom edge of the picture was covered, was taped over, covered with tape. And so the paint underneath has been kept in relative dark. And I hope you can see that it's a, a much peachier, pinkier colour, um, which is turned towards purple further into the painting that has been exposed to light after 1931. I've sort of helped with this line to show the division. Uh, this is the only graph I'll be showing, um, but it's to show you that Apart from the cochineal lake that we identified in the background, we also found that the main culprit was the geranium lake, that's the not notorious uh, fugitive lake sort that I previously mentioned. And that's thought to be the disappearance of this lake in the paint mixture is thought to be the main reason for colour change. Another effect of colour change in the floor is this green, what I'm going to call a patch, underneath the left chair. Um, it tends to read a bit like a shadow, whereas Vakoch wrote that he didn't paint shadows or... Uh, cast shadows in this picture. And indeed, in older reproductions, we don't see that green patch. And it's not just an artefact of the different reproductions techni technique. But it, here in this 1928 repro reproduction, you can begin to see a faint tinge under the chair, but it's nowhere as prominent as it is now. By chance, the previous restorer folded over uh, a, left, a section of the left side of the painting uh, over the stretcher. So we can see that there, where the, green, where the paint is green on the front side, it still preserves a bright orange where it's been kept in the dark. And so you have to imagine it's, it's this section here. This is the floor, and then we zoom in in stages. And in these tiny damages where there's a surface loss of paint, you can see that there's an even brighter colour at the interior. There's indirect evidence that the red lakes have faded where mixed with, with white, as one would expect, due to greater uh, reflectance of light within the paint film. For example, this is the, the landscape painted on the background wall. You can see the white sky, where it's actually meant to be a, um, a sunset. And indeed, in the other two versions, particularly in Paris, you can see that the sky is still bright pink. And there's also a flush of pink in the picture in Chicago, where the Eocene Lake has been identified, so originally it would have been pinker too. Van Gogh himself wrote that the only white note in the painting was the mirror with its black frame, which is actually dark Prussian blue. 
And here we see the mirror in all three versions uh, of, of the bedroom. Moreover, he wrote that um, since there was no white in the painting, that the actual frame of the painting should be white. And here we see the picture exhibited in 1912 in what must have been its original uh, white frame. So to attempt a, a digital reconstruction uh, using all these bits of evidence, an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary team was put together consisting of art historians, a painter, conservators, scientists, and um, input from these different disciplines steered the reconstruction towards its final result. And here I, I should stress that the word final shouldn't be taken literally since having gone through many different versions, you can see at the top right, uh, we're well aware that this might not be the only um, end result. And also right from the beginning, another thing I'd like to stress is that we were aware that the reconstruction would not be an exact equivalent to how the painting looked originally. But still, uh, even though it's scientifically based, the end result will be inf uh, based on informed judgment. But still, we felt that the very process of doing this and weighing up all these bits of evidence would help us to get closer towards understanding what Fahok intended. So I'm not going to go into the, the mathematical principles of how this was done. If you're interested, you can read this, for example, one uh, public publication listed here. I can give you more details. Um, but just to illustrate this graphically, so the idea is that you feed in the colour that has disappeared um, up until, sort of in, this, in this case, the Eerson Lake with a mixture of lead white, up until the level that you think um, it should be. To do this, you need to know the spectral properties of the pigment. And we were able to measure the, spe the spectrum of Geranium Lake uh, from other paintings by Van Gogh. This is a picture also in the exhibition. It's a small painting that he painted on dishcloth that he prepared with a ground layer consisting of lead white with Geranium Lake. In the cross section, you can see just how bright that paint layer was originally, but it's now faded uh, to a sort of dull white where you can see it. But there were some spots of the colour that had been preserved where we could take colour measurements that we could use for the reconstruction for the bedroom painting. So this is to show you the effect of feeding in the geranium lake back into the floor. You can see that the green patch is gone and the colour of the floor is uh, more reddish. And here, of feeding it back into the landscape painting on the back wall. The same thing was done with the cochineal lake that had disappeared from, from the walls and the doors. And in this case, we gained the spectral measurements from actual paint uh, reconstructions. So reconstructions of Fahok's paints uh, that we were able to measure. So on the left, you see the current condition. On the right, after feeding uh, the red lake back into the walls. And here the doors. And what I hope to show now is a film that puts this... I've been showing you step by step, but actually it's much more effective uh, if you see it in the time-lapse film, so you get a, a general impression of the overall effect. You can see that some of the other colours have been uh, rejuvenated as well, so we took a sort of holistic uh, approach. So to show you um, the painting after restoration on the left and the digital reconstruction beside it, and just to summarise what the main differences uh, are, I think replacing the light blue with violet eliminates a false sense of space, so it it looks much flatter, and it better reflects the cramped space of the bedroom interior. It also gives a much flatter, more decorative effect, more in the manner of a Japanese print, as Fahok wrote, uh, that he actually intended. And of course, it introduces the complementary colour contrast of violet and yellow as the theme of the colour scheme. We can also understand much better why Fahok felt that by hanging the bedroom painting next to the night cafe, which is now in uh, Yale University Art Gallery, that it would um, give contrast. This is a night cafe. Of course, the two are completely, they contrast in mood. They're completely different uh, subjects. Uh, the bedroom painting being painted in the daytime, the night cafe at night, the bedroom being suggestive of rest or sleep, and the night cafe being a place, as he described, where you could go mad and commit crimes. But originally, this contrast in mood would have been reinforced or their opposite color schemes. 
So the bedroom painting on the left being based on the complementary contrast of violet and yellow and the night cafe with red and green. And again, I couldn't resist putting these little balls of wool um, showing you them beside them because they give such a close parallel. So finally, I'd just like to briefly uh, contemplate, as a conservator, um, it was quite confronting to be doing the actual treatment of the painting and looking at the digital reconstruction at the same time because the results were quite different. So um, I'd like to think a little bit about what knowing uh, awareness of the colour change of the painting, how that affected the way of thinking about the restoration and conservation and the choices that were made. Um, I mentioned briefly that the painting was last treated, uh, there was a major treatment in 1931 by J.C. Tras, who was a very young man at the time. Um, there's very little known about him, and this is one of the rare photos when he was actually close to retirement. And by this time, he was a well-known restorer working in the Maritz house. So he first uh, treated the painting in 1931, and again retreated it in 1958, as I'll come back to. And it's interesting to compare the, yeah, the, the philosophy of the, f the first treatment uh, with, the, with the one that we recently, co recently conducted. And we have this rather nice uh, document. We don't have so many documents about Trace's work, but it's a, a bill for payment. And he, he describes that with considerable effort and discussion, it was possible to return the painting to its original, that's my capital's, uh, condition. And of course, nowadays, uh, ideas have shifted, and we're well aware that that original condition doesn't exist anymore, since paintings, they continue to change from the moment that, that they leave the easel. But Truss himself would have been confronted with the colour change within his own uh, lifetime. As I mentioned, in 1958, he treated the painting again and he reworked it. Geheel was bijgewerkt. And probably, although it's not specified what this entailed, it looks as if he adjusted his own retouches. Um, applied 27 years earlier, since they no longer matched the original paint that had continued to change colour uh, over 27 years. You may remember this detail that shows you the colour at the bottom edge of the, the floor as it would have been when Charles first treated the picture with this peachy colour and this continuing colour change that took place after that date. And these are two details of Charles's retouches and I think you can see, I hope you can see, that the peachy base colour, so this is a, a loss in the original paint that's been filled in by Truss, but it's been done in two stages. There's a peachy pink that's actually very close to the colour preserved along the bottom edge. That he, so that's his first retouch in 1931. And then there's these darker purplish uh, hatchings, which he would have applied in 1958 to bring the retouchings back to the colour of the original paint surrounding Another advantage of the last treatment was that we could t uh, take advantage of colour science in the choice of choosing appropriate pigments to carry out retouching. As I mentioned, the picture was very badly damaged by water damage in Fajoch's studio, um, as described by Fajoch, and he stuck newspapers onto it in view of flaking paint. And there were some nice remnants of the actual newsletters from the newsprint, which are still there after the restoration. This is a during treatment photograph. It in fact, there was many more losses than we had uh, anticipated. They're quite well defined, quite confined. Um, but you can see these losses of paint that go right down to the canvas support that are the result of this uh, flaking damage due to damp in the studio. This is after filling the losses. And then the next stage is to, to very precisely fill in these losses um, using pigments in a, in a binding medium so as to render them not, not obtrusive, so they're not disturbing. And for this, as I mentioned, I was able to have the benefit of uh, color sign, working together with a color scientist. Uh, Roy Burns had measured the colors on the painting at many different spots. And this is, for example, the brightest spot uh, of original color in the floor. It's measured with a spectrophotometer. And that corresponds to the blue curve in this graph. And what uh, Roy was able to do using uh, computer calculations um, was to recommend a pigment mixture that would produce exactly the same curve, exactly the same colour. Um, but moreover, that this matching colour would persist under different lighting conditions. So I don't know if you've had the experience, you go in the morning, maybe you have two dark socks on, you think they're both black, and then you get into work, and one is blue and one is black. 
Um, well, the same thing can happen when you're retouching. If I retouch in the studio and then the picture's hung somewhere else. Um, so this is very important to have this information um, to ensure that my retouches look good under different lighting conditions. Moreover, um, it's not a... I mean, it's not a, a wonder tool, but it was a great um, asset to speed up the retouching process. Retouching still always depends on um, yeah, manual and visual skills, but having this recommended mixture of pigments certainly was a big bonus. So these are the pigments uh, that were recommended for retouching that particular colour in the floor in a certain proportion. And here on the left, to detail after filling and then after retouching the losses with these recommended pigments on the right. This is the painting after restoration. As you'll notice, most of our, of all of the Van Gogh paintings are hung uh, behind um, non-reflective glass. And in fact, they're sandwiched in what we call a sort of a microclimate case. There's a backing board on the back of the pictures and glass on the front. So it's like a sealed package. And this will help to slow down uh, any possible fluctuations in climate. So although we can't um, stop the process of colour change, we can hopefully slow it down to a, a negligible, negligible uh, uh, rate by carefully, very stringent guidelines for lighting and climate control. And this is the last slide I'd like to show you. It's the painting as it went back to the gallery after treatment in 2010. There was some discussion about how we should show the digital reconstruction. In the end, we chose to show it in the proximity of the painting so you can look back from one to the other and compare uh, but you can also just choose to focus on the painting and enjoy it uh, itself, if you prefer. And I'd like to thank uh, the many colleagues that have contributed in this process. It's a very interdisciplinary process. I'd like to thank my colleagues at uh, RCE, that's the Dutch uh, Cultural Heritage Agency, and at Shell, our partners in science, who did all the uh, analyt analytical research. And I'd like to thank members of the um, reconstruction team, uh, at the museum, Maurice Tromp, digital imaging expert, art historians Lou van Tilburg, Tayo Maidendorp, Roy Burns, colour scientist, and Monica Rothhans, artist. And thank you for listening. Thank you.